If you have any questions about the program as we kind of run through this presentation and the application process uh, or other you know, uh, pieces, uh, please post them in the chat. Uh, we'll be sending out answers to all of our participants today and posting them in our uh, frequently asked questions uh, section of our website. This session is being translated, and so if you'd like, I, I'd, I'd first like to thank our translators for being here today. Uh, and uh, you know, if you are looking for a French version, uh, you can uh, click over to that. Uh, it's a bottom prompt on your screen. Uh, it's uh, also being recorded and will be posted online. I guess uh, I just want to take a moment now. I'm really excited uh, to move into uh, first presentation. Um, when um, when it comes uh, to equity, you know, obviously, uh, one of our program's main objectives is to help support reconciliation uh, and reconnect our neighborhoods and gathering spots with Indigenous history, culture, and communities. Uh, the first project we want, wanted you to hear uh, from is uh, and hear about is from Hamilton, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Weaver, Director of Collections and Program Development at the Hamilton Public Library. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Jared. Your introduction really summed up why we applied for the project at the Hamilton Public Library. We recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. As we respond in, to the ongoing pandemic response and recovery, the library is committed to ensuring a resilient recovery for everyone who lives, works, and studies in the city of Hamilton. And so while we've seen downtown a large turnover of businesses and um, reduced opportunities for members of the community to connect with one another due to various restrictions, we really felt that a market at the library, because the library continues to be quite active between vaccination clinics, passport laminations, and also having a uh, food market right next door. And so the Indigenous market at HPL's main goal was to support economic growth, provide space for Indigenous artists, to, and for members to meet, learn, and connect with each other. We chose this particular project because we have uh, we are focused on truth and reconciliation as one of our main priorities of programming at the Hamilton Public Library. And we felt like there was a lack of space um, downtown for artists and specifically Indigenous artists in our community. We were overwhelmed with the response that we received from our call out. Uh, we, the biggest learning from our call out was that this call out allowed us to connect with folks who had traditionally not been in the library or had connected with the library in various ways. The other thing that we learned, uh, not only by connecting with new artists who are able to participate in our market, is all the other supports that are available in the community who had not connected with the library or that the artists themselves had not connected with and so we will be applying for the second round of funding from all the learnings that we'd had from our first round and those include small business supports uh, social media supports and specifically um, marketing supports for Indigenous small businesses. And while the library isn't the answer for all the um, resilient recovery supports that Indigenous small business and artists need in our community, the library is a place where all those connections can happen. And we are so grateful to be working with the Urban Indigenous Strategy at the City of Hamilton for all the outreach and connections that we'll be moving forward with, um, with our round two of the Indigenous market. Um, and so we're so thankful to the Canadian Urban Institute for the supports that we were provided to make sure that the market continued. Through various restrictions, there were some limits in how many folks could come in, but we um, also have learned that supporting our Indigenous, local Indigenous artists with some online supports and setting up some online stores, we can override those restrictions and still make sure that there is an active way for members to be able to connect with the um, amazing, talented and very creative and generous Indigenous artists in our community. And so in summary, I would strongly recommend that anyone who's interested in uh, starting up something similar, please don't hesitate to connect with us. Um, this process was actually quite streamlined. Again, working with the Urban Indigenous Strategy, they had so many connections and we really ended up being the back end folks, just facilitating the space and the online forms and surveys and the artist 
they were they were already set up to go and really were just looking for that um, affordable space where folks could gather uh, within restriction limits. So thanks for the time, Jared, and I'm going to pass it back to you. That's really great. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, appreciate uh, the overview and, and summary of the project. Certainly, one of the ones we were we were excited. Uh, you know, when we when we saw you know your project come in uh, through the assessment phase, uh, there were a number of our, our, our assessors who were really excited about about your project and you know, believe you're doing some important work. Um, so, thank you. Next up, we have uh, Yu Kang Lee, uh, the executive director of the Chinatown BIA in Ottawa. Like many places, Ottawa has seen an increase in anti-Asian hate over the last few years. Uh, and this project is uh, part of an effort uh, to address that troubling racism. Uh, Yu Kang's project was extremely highly rated, uh, again, by our assessment team, and we're really excited to, to see it come to fruition. Yu Kang. Hello, Jared. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind comments on our project. Uh, to everyone, good afternoon. My name is Yu Kang Lee, and I am the executive director of the Ottawa Sunset uh, Somerset Street, Chinatown BIA. Please allow me to start with a big thank you to the My Main Street team. They are great people to work with and are very good at answering my questions during the whole process. I'm thankful to have this opportunity to exchange ideas with my peer community leaders. Um, <clears throat> before I move on to the project, I'd like to take a minute to play a video which showcases the great community of Ottawa's Chinatown which is a hub for new and established immigrants and small businesses. There goes the video. You can, I'm not quite seeing it. Um, might still have to share it. Oh, am I not sharing the screen? I don't think so, no. Oh, sorry. Let's start again. Can you see my screen? We can now, yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. There you go. Welcome to Ottawa Chinatown, your home away from home. Visit Chinatown to experience the exotic culture, endless authentic dining gems, and most welcoming local businesses. Chinatown businesses need your support. Please consider ordering takeout or delivery. Support local. Dining out on the weekend? Free parking on weekends. Make Ottawa Chinatown part of your New Year's resolution for 2022. Don't forget to check our 2022 Multicultural Artwork Contest at ottawachinatown.ca forward slash artwork. Sorry about the glitch, and I hope you liked the video. By the way, the voice over at the beginning of the video is the new commercial broadcasted at FM 98.5 during the holiday season. This has been made possible with the support from the My Main Street program. Back to Ottawa Chinatown. While we're rich in cultural heritage, we have quite some challenges in front of us. This area has been historically less developed about 30% of the population in our area are racial minorities. Buildings and public facilities are time-worn, drug use-related incidents, as well as racism and hate crimes are reported from time to time, which has caused great anxiety among business owners, residents, and visitors. And on top of this, in case you have not noticed yet, the COVID-19 pandemic happened and consequently, the business community was hit hard during the lockdowns. Average revenue has dropped by 75% or so. <clears throat> we identified the need for extra human and financial 
resources to explore market research and to develop a strategic plan, as well as the need for some overdue product, projects to regain vibrancy. But funding restraints did not, did not allow us to move forward. This is one of the many reasons we are so excited to be participating in my main street programs. For the Sunset Street Chinatown BIA, my main street program came at the perfect time. Chinatown BIA is very fortunate to have been selected for both of my main street program streams, which will support us to take on some projects that we have not been able to implement due to the lack of resources. As part of the Community Activator Program, we were fortunate enough to receive support for a few projects in year one, which fall into the events and activations and community, community improvements themes and include lighting installations, landscaping, murals, and media promotional campaigns. These, the objectives of such projects are to raise awareness of Chinatown as a vibrant community and an attraction in Ottawa. I'd like to particularly share with you one project that I am very excited about. This is a two-phase project that is a combination of several themes of what my main street can do to support your community. The picture shown in this slide is a concrete planter on Sunset Street West. The planters were decorated with some printed fabrics some years ago. And as time goes by, the wrappers became loose or damaged and the redecoration of the planters comes in two, two phases. In phase one, we launched a citywide youth artist competition focused on indigenous, Asian and multicultural heritages that form modern Canadian culture. The competition aims to promote humanity, racial equality and cultural inclusiveness among our younger generations and to encourage intergenerational connectedness. The project is ongoing right now. And uh, we are working with schools and um, art groups, both within and outside the Chinatown area. In phase two, which will take place in the spring, once the jury has selected the artwork, honors and awards will be granted to the artists to rec recognize their contributions. Furthermore, the selected artwork that features a big variety of cultural symbols will be printed or painted on the planters with a QR code that links to a web page where you will find a bio of the young artist, their creative train of thoughts, and elaborations of their work piece, and the culture the artwork features in, and even more, the businesses that are related to that specific culture. Public particip participation is important to this project as one of our objectives is to draw attention to Chinatown and increase the food traffic to our neighborhood. At launch, the event will get publicity among the young artists, their families, schools, as well as the general public. Then when the second phase is completed in later uh, this year, we'd like to have full exposure of this project and Chinatown on multiple media platforms. To sum up, this project will beautify our streets, increase food traffic, and bring potential customers to Chinatown. But most importantly, it promotes cultural awareness, understanding, and inclusiveness, as well as racial equality in our society. I think that is the highlight of this project. Um, here comes my last slide. Before I wrap up, I'd, um, I'd like to thank, thank the My Main Street team again. And for my peer community leaders, thank you for your time. I'd love to hear and learn from your ideas. My email is ed at ottawachinatown.ca. Good luck with your project. Thank you, Derek. That's excellent. Yeah, thanks very much, Yukang. Um, I had a chance to stop by uh, the uh, Chinatown BIA and um, shop and back in November. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think the the work that you're doing here is uh, is you know obviously really important. 
Um, and I wish you, of course, uh, best of luck as the year goes on. Um, when um, when we think about equity, of course, uh, and uh, you know, this, we we really can't uh, avoid talking about poverty. Uh, you know, the pandemic has uh, further widened the divide between haves and, and have-nots, and the impacts on our local economies and workforce has meant uh, that many people in Ontario simply do not have enough uh, to eat. Uh, it's, um, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our next speakers. Uh, Jeremy Horrell, president and co-founder of uh, Urban Roots London, and uh, Randy uh, uh, Donkervoort, uh, garden project lead uh, for the Siloam United Church uh, to talk about their London Community Garden Project. Over to you, Jeremy and Randy. Uh, Randy, you're still muted. How's that? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Our Urban Garden Project is a partnership that was formed in the fall of 2020 between Siloam United Church and Urban Roots London, which is a nonprofit organization. Siloam had a quarter acre of vacant land on their property, which they wanted to utilize to grow fresh produce. This produce would be distributed to communities where families were experiencing food insecurity. Urban Roots London takes underutilized land and transforms this land into urban gardens that produce healthy and nutritious food. We call this the perfect partnership because as a faith community, we don't have the skill or the knowledge to create, let alone operate an urban garden. Urban Roots London, on the other hand, has the knowledge and wherewithal to create and operate an urban farm. They just need arable land to grow produce. With more and more families relying on food banks in order to help, ends make, help make ends meet, there continues to be an immediate need to make fresh, nutritious, and healthy food accessible to families. So at this point, I'm going to take uh, and turn this presentation over to Jeremy, who will take you through the, our progress that we had throughout uh, this year. Thank you, Randy. And uh, what you're looking at is um, Urban Roots and Siloam working together with community volunteers to be able to prepare the space. Uh, we prepared the space in spring, spring of 2021 when we had a little bit of a break in weather. Uh, we were able to get uh, the fence posts and the netting and the mulch in place with volunteers from some of our local uh, post-secondary institutions um, and with the help of the City of London providing the mulch for us to be able to uh, have our pathways mulched. So uh, there were many opportunities throughout the year for individuals to volunteer, uh, learn and grow and participate in not only the development of the garden, but in each and every stage of the garden as we continued to grow, as the plants grew and as we made harvesting a priority on the farm uh, to get food to people. So you can see uh, in the presentation, there's a bunch of pictures of all of the lovely produce that we were able to um, get throughout the season. Uh, over the spring and summer, we had some uh, students uh, that were hired uh, at a living wage to be able to do the work. Farm work is often undervalued uh, in our society and we wanted to make sure that uh, people were paid uh, for the work that they were doing because it's an incredible, incredibly hard job uh, to be able to work on a small scale farm uh, using your hands and specific small scale tools. So we had four uh, staff throughout the season uh, who not only worked in the garden to tend to the plants, who listened to the plants and who took care of the plants, but they also connected with individuals who came to the farm uh, to share and let people experience the farm for what they wanted to come there for. Some of them brought their grandchildren uh, to be able to come run around and learn stuff about the plants. Uh, other people came out and wanted to harvest. Some people came out and just wanted to sit and connect with the staff. And that was equally as important for us in this project uh, and not just the harvesting of the food and taking you know, from the land. We wanted to be able to give back to the community, make sure that people see the connections between the food that's being produced uh, and you know, the inputs that are required and the labor, but also what we can do to give back to that um, land specifically. 
And so by the end of the September, the garden project had generated uh, over 3,000 pounds of food. Uh, and so our first harvest was in uh, June uh, till September. Um, and so that's a, a pretty high yield uh, for what we had, but uh, not only did we take from the land, but we give back to the land and we were making sure that we were adding, you know, those rich nutrient compost that uh, we were producing on site. And we were making sure that we were planting cover crops to be able to not have bare earth and allow for those things to sequester carbon um, because that's healthier for the soil. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Randy. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so the grant from My Main Street has allowed us to accelerate and scale up the garden to potentially double our output to 6,000 pounds for 2022. And so Jeremy is going to tell you how these funds were actually put to use. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, there was a lot of work in, in creating a new site uh, to be able to do that in a way that was efficient, um, but also allowed us for do, to do things like clearing out invasive species that were on the site. Uh, there was a considerable amount of invasive species uh, that were on the site that needed to be tended to. Uh, and uh, we utilized organic practices and we wanted to make sure that we were doing that in a way that wasn't uh, you know, spraying anything that didn't need to be sprayed onto the plants uh, that were there and that we did it in a really holistic kind way uh, because we wanna be able to use that earth to be able to grow an orchard, which we did start. Um, we were able to get our water set up so that we had a really efficient way for the staff to be able to provide the plants with the water that they need to be able to thrive. Uh, we were able to get some secure storage on site for the tools and the bins and the materials that we needed to uh, harvest all of the produce that was coming out every week. Uh, we um, also uh, we're able to purchase several specialized tools to allow for more efficiencies on the farm uh, because the, the work can be really hard work and we want to be able to be as efficient as we can uh, and as kind as we can and not tearing things up all over the place. So um, going forward in 2022, we are going to continue on with our orchard planting. We are going to create a pollinator habitat um, through planting of native species uh, around the site. And we're going to be turning a small wooded area on the site into a productive food forest with uh, native fruit bearing trees and bushes that uh, can be harvested along with that food. And all of our food uh, that was produced on that site was donated to community organizations, uh, delivered through electric vehicle and delivered to families the day of harvest which is pretty impressive. Thanks, Jeremy. So as you can see, we have a very ambitious and long-term plan to grow and expand our urban garden project. So we'd like to thank My Main Street for approving our project and providing this generous grant. These funds have accelerated our ability to make available a long-term source of fresh, nutritious food to communities in the city of London. So thank you all. That's great. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Jeremy. Really appreciate the presentation and the kind words um, and, and amazing to see uh, the, the work that you're doing in, in London. Um, so congratulations. Um, we, uh, you know, through the My Main Street Community Activator Program, we're, we're funding projects big and small uh, and of all different kinds. Uh, it can be policy development, community enhancements or ongoing events and activations. Placemaking projects, you know, don't have to be complex um, to make an impact. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, excited, uh, I think, to, to welcome, you know, our next, uh, our next panelists, um, Elder Peter Schuler and Oakville Community Foundation CEO, Wendy Rinella, to talk about uh, the simple and powerful project that they're leading. Thank you, Jared. And I'm going to invite to Elder Peter Schuler. There he is. Great to see you. Um, the other person joining us from our project is Jillian McLaren, who's the project lead, and she's going to be helping us with the, the slide deck. So thank you, Jared. Thank you, the My Main Street team. And we're so grateful for this funding. Um, it's really advanced our project um, a lot further than I ever anticipated we would be. I'm gonna speak first and give some details and then Elder Schuler is going to share the impact of the 
of the actual project and the grant. So I'm going to start by saying, Ani, I'm a tr proud treaty person from Treaty 14 and 22. And if you came to Oakville, you would have no idea that we're on treaty lands, who the treaties are with, and what the treaties are about. So last October, in partnership with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and guided by our Indigenous Culture Advisor, Elder Peter Schuler, we launched Dibwaywin, the Oakville Truth Project. Dibwaywin refers to one of the seven Anishinaabeg grandfather teachings for truth. So as part of local truth and reconciliation, we're asking, what is Oakville's truth? Oakville's largely bereft of living Indigenous heritage, knowledge of the local treaties, and their role in leaving the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation landless. It's a truthful story, but it's not well known. This placemaking project recognizes that Treaty 22 and 14 are living, breathing documents, and it identifies their presence on the land. Now this grant has paid for the development of the logo, which was on the previous page and a website using indigenous designers a land surveyor to map the treaties and then physically identify them with signage. And I'm gonna show you some of those highlights. So the only sources of knowledge about where the treaties are came from the original surveys. And you'll see them on the left, or at least my left that I'm looking at. And they're over 200 years old. And those are actual documents from the Canadian archives. And there's been a modern update on the right, which is what the Mississaugas have used. But if you look at it, you'll see there's really no identification of where they land on the streets. And when you look at that updated interpretation, the areas that's marked in the lines down the waterfront from Burlington to, to, to Etobicoke is the head of the Lake Treaty, and it's called Treaty 14. The yellow areas are Treaty 22, and the large yellow area is the Port Credit River in Mississauga. And the two smaller areas are in Oakville and they surround our two creeks. Now, this area where the trees are of 22 are actually encompass the three business improvement areas in Oakville. It's the most populated area. It's the most trafficked areas in Oakville. But it'll be unclear if you are in Oakville in these areas, what treaty you're standing on and what the significance of those treaties are. So the town is one of our partners in, in this and the town shared a map with a land surveyor who has virtually mapped it onto a streetscape, which Jill's gonna show you on our next page. So you're looking at that on the left. And when you go onto the website, um, it will show you exactly where it is, uh, where you're standing on that tree. So we're doing virtual mapping as well as land-based mapping. So you'll see on the right is the uh, treaty signage that's been um, in production by the town. And there are QR codes that will link you to videos as well as information about uh, the two treaties. So that's kind of the overview of the project. And now I'm going to turn it over to Elder Peter Schuler to share his thoughts about the impact. Miigwech. Um, so my taxpayer name is uh, Peter Schuler, but uh, what I gave you before was my Ojibwe name. I'm uh, from the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Turtle Clan. And uh, part of this uh, project, um, when I was talking with Wendy the other day, I, I, uh, I recalled something from uh, over 50 years ago that uh, was my, I guess, first, uh, look at Oakville. And so over 50 years ago, I was working for a roofing company and they sent me uh, down there to uh, help put a, a roof on a pumping station, which was right on the lake. And as I drove there, and uh, I think at that time I was probably around 20 years old, um, I had this strange thing happen to me. As, as I was looking for this street, because at that time you didn't have uh, all the stuff we have nowadays to guide you around and get you lost. You had to get lost on your own back then. And so I had this really, really strong sense of deja vu, even though I had never, ever been uh, in that uh, part of the 
of the world before. Uh, I had never been in that area, but I had this really, 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 I, I can't describe how strong this sense of deja vu was. And uh, so that was my first uh, uh, look at Oakville. And at that time, I didn't know anything about the history. I didn't know um, much of my culture or anything. Um, but that when I came to that little pumping station, uh, a, a, actually a funny thing happened because it was just a concrete uh, deck. There was water on there. And so myself and this other guy, we were there first. So we started to, to um, get the water off. And all we had was a shovel and a bucket. And so we shoveled the water into a bucket. And my co-worker went and there was a roof drain there. And he poured the water down the drain. Well, there was a big noise came from inside there and this plumber come running out, mattered and all get out because he was about ready to hook up that drain and all that water hit him in the face. <laughs> well, we didn't know that thing wasn't hooked up. And he was come up the, he came up our ladder with a, a pipe wrench ready to kill my coworker. And my coworker put his foot on the ladder and pushed it out and said, I don't think you want to come any further because you might go down faster than you come up. And he said, well, you know, he apologized for, for the guy getting in the water in his face and, you know, explained the situation. And that diffused the situation and everybody had a good laugh. Um, so during my lifetime, I have experienced racism and those kind of things. And um, when I look back on that, what diffused the situation was the education of the receiver of that water in the face, that it was a mistake and that uh, there was an apology made. And um, uh, it was basically education. And so with this project, um, there is, as Wendy indicated, very, very little knowledge of the history of Oakville. And, and this goes, I would say to both uh, the residents of Oakville and our Mississauga people that we don't really um, know a lot of the history. We do, but we, we um, um, I would say that not everyone on the, on the credit reserve knows about this history. Um, and so when you have racism, it's usually because one party or the other doesn't know the other party. They're not aware of each other's habits and the way we do things, et cetera, et cetera. And if you can educate those parties, in most instances, I believe that they can get along together and that racism diminishes or disappears. And so with this project, um, it becomes an awareness project where we uh, disseminate the history and where people can get to know each other. And part of this, uh, we have some ideas about, um, you know, cross-cultural uh, exchanges that might happen when, uh, when uh, this pandemic passes by. Uh, we have an idea to uh, make t-shirts that would identify the treaty partners and that you can be proud to be a treaty partner. Um, we have these uh, signage that we want to get uh, in place so that when you're driving through, you're gonna be able to see and, and uh, a sign that says you're here and you're on the, this treaty territory, which hopefully is gonna make your curiosity rise up and you might just kind of try to find out where did this sign come from and who put it there and why is it here? And then starts the process of learning about your own uh, community. And it is the same with uh, our community. When we go through that area, we can begin to look at, um, you know, what was there before. And um, uh, one of the things that I, I uh, like to talk about is the environment. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to picture uh, what was here before and what is here now. Um, and what can we do to preserve what is left of the environment? And all those kind of things I think can come out of this project. And um, 
uh, you know, I, I uh, give a lot of credit to Wendy for her ideas and her uh, expertise in looking for monies and uh, other partners that might come in to, uh, to help us uh, get these ideas rolling. And um, I myself, I have a lot of ideas, but uh, how to implement them is not my expertise. Uh, I just throw rocks into the gears and see what happens. And um, sometimes it sparks, sometimes the gears stop, but whatever happens, it causes a reaction and then people can start to do something. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to um, seeing this project uh, expand and, you know, when we can have our annual powwow, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that there's going to be a whole bunch of people from Oakville come to uh, have a look and listen. And, um, you know, we become neighbors, not close together neighbors, but we come, become neighbors. And um, as I said to Wendy, there's a lot of things that um, have to come to the kitchen table before you can make any change. And, um, you know, the kitchen table um, might start with the sign that says, here you are in the, on this, and you're a treaty partner. And at the kitchen table, people might start asking, hey, what is this? And the conversations might spark that, uh, that curiosity. And that curiosity then leads to education. And um, so this is my hope for this project. And I, I want to thank that. Uh, Main Street for um, supporting this. Um, and um, I look forward to um, seeing what happens. I always like to poke things just to see what happens. And, uh, and I'm hoping that something good happens out of this. So, Miigwech, Bizendelweg, thanks for listening. And I'll turn it back to whoever is on the gas pedal next. <laughs> Thank you, Elder Schuler, and thank you, Wendy, um, for those for those words. Uh, I've got some family in Oakville, and I look forward to uh, exploring um, and 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 seeking, you know, really seeking those sign that those pieces of signage, uh, you know, in the coming coming years. Um, I um, yeah, grateful for your time. Um, we have a uh, we have a bit of time that left, uh, and I I think uh, it would be really interesting to hear perhaps a little more from our panelists. Uh, and before we, uh, and, and, you know, for, for those of you who are, you know, in the audience and, and listening, please, you know, add questions or comments, you know, to the chat. Um, but one thing I would really like to hear from, you know, the panelists uh, together on is uh, a question about what you're learning through your projects. And love to hear some of the kind of key learnings that, that you've, uh, you've, you know, stumbled upon either through success or through failure. Uh, you know, often we learn, I personally I, I, and professionally I always find that I learn the most when I fail. Um, and, you know, I'd love to learn more of, um, for, you know, for the benefit of, of folks who are here today, uh, you know, what, what you're learning from your projects. But also ask, of course, you know, as you're responding, please, uh, to our panelists, please uh, turn your cameras on. Wendy and uh, Elder Schuller, thanks for keeping yours on. Um, but uh, yeah, over, over to our panelists. Did you want us to share since we seem sure. to be the only ones on camera? <laughs> sure. Then we then we can pick on Randy and Jeremy and Yukang and others. Um, well, I learned that it's a lot easier to work with the Mississaugas than it is to work with the town council. So that was a good learning. Am I allowed to say that? Uh <laughs> <laughs> it's a great learning. <laughs> yeah. I, it's um what has surprised me since we announced this project. Um so we do a lot of funding uh, on equity initiatives. And five years ago when the Syrian refugees were being sponsored into Canada, we set up a resettlement fund. And um, I got a lot of angry um, messages. Let's just leave it at that. And um, which was a real change. Um, I wasn't expecting it. And it kind of struck me and, and uh, made me a little uh, surprised. But when uh, we announced the Debuelen uh, initiative in October, all I received was people who wanted to participate and support it. 
which I was shocked about. I was um, concerned that it was, we would get, um, and we were prepared for as Elder Schuler will likely share um, some anti-Indigenous racism. We've, we've got an advisory council with, uh, you know, the former commission reporter uh, who wrote the report for missing and murdered Indigenous women, Dr. Kareen Duhamel. We have Kevin Lemoreau, who's a um, professor at University of Winnipeg and the former education lead for the National Center on Truth and Reconciliation. So we have been kind of prepared that we might get that type of reaction. But um, the thing that surprised me is how much support there has been within the community, which I just feel so um, happy about. Yeah, the, um, the support has been very good. And um, um, yeah, I think just from my own um, experience that uh, for the most part, if you're honest with people, you're upfront, you um, um, don't go there with a big chip on your shoulder to the, to the front, even though that might be there, you can take it off and put it someplace else for a while. Um, that's one of the things I learned is that um, you can't be angry uh, even though our history is not uh, uh, or has not been that kind to us. Uh, can't say that it's been fair. You can't say it's been just. You can't even say much good about it at all. Um, but you can't go and carry that around. You have to get rid of that. And uh, and it's the same with racism. You, you have to get rid of the anger in order to get rid of the racism. And... Um, in order to do that, you have to understand what it is you're angry about. And um, um, I think, um, and, I, and I based this on my own experience um, that, um, you know, you have certain biases that maybe you don't, you aren't, you're not born racist, <laughs> you're taught that. And so you have these biases that may exist and in its exposure to uh, that group that you've been told is not so good. It's exposure to that group that uh, you meet a person that's not exactly or even a, at all like what all these people were described to be. And, the, and you realize people are just people. And, uh, you know, I look at this today when we have all this vax and anti-vax business going on. When I go out into the world, I don't see anti-vax vax people, I don't see vax people, I just see people. And this is, is, is a, I think, uh, the way we need to look at people. And even our traditional teachings, there's a teaching that says there is only one human race. And, um, and this is something that we should remember because, um, you know, we're all in this together. And, um, you know, you can't uh, survive in a in a uh, hostile environment if you're fighting with this person beside you. And the goal of everybody is to survive. So that's kind of the way I look at things is, you know, you don't have to dislike somebody just because you don't agree with what they think. And um, sometimes, uh, you know, I don't even agree with myself. So <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we have to get past that. Anyway, I better quit talking because I talk too much. So I appreciate that and appreciate the um, uh, the comments, you know, uh, Peter and, and and Wendy as well. I, I Jeremy, I think, wants to jump in. Uh, we've also got some questions coming in on the chat. We'll get to those in a sec. Uh, Jeremy, over to you. Thank you. I think one of the biggest things that uh, I've learned uh, as part of Urban Roots is that um, beyond food production, it, it allows for opportunity to people to feel connection, not only to each other, but to the plants and the animals that are around you. And you'd be very surprised at some of the plants that pop up uh, out of nowhere that are native that can actually provide food um, to individuals that uh, I myself have had to learn over the last several years. And uh, every time something new comes up on site that hasn't been there, you know, a couple of years at our other site and, and it's just like, wow, this is kind of really a blessing to be able to have this pop up at this time so that we can have conversations about it, share about it and learn about what that is. Um, so that's a really beautiful piece uh, to our project that we can share that with other people as well. 
That's really excellent. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Um, Want to offer up some space to to Yu Kang uh, and uh, and others, other panelists, um, in case you want to jump in, Lisa or others, about some of the kind of key learnings that have kind of come uh, come out of your projects uh, so far. Um, feel free to turn on your cameras and jump in. Um, I uh, want to just go to the chat here. There is a question uh, from Jessica. Uh, this question is for Elder Schuler and for Wendy. Uh, and uh, you know, thanks for for sharing your stories. Um, uh, they wonder if uh, you could share, if uh, you know, a little bit more about the project itself in Oakville. Um, if there was conflict about treaty overlapping uh, traditional territories, uh, how you worked towards building common understanding before putting uh, quote uh, lines on a map. End quote. Well, I can give some history um, of truth and reconciliation issues in our community. Uh, so since um, 2017, um, the Oakville Community Foundations had a very strong working relationship, uh, particularly through GIMA, which is the Anishinaabe way of saying chief, La Forme, and have worked with community partners on a variety of events. We've built moccasin trails. Um, we actually send all grade fives well, <laughs> pre-COVID, down the moccasin trails in Oakville. We send uh, the, we were sending the grade eights to see a performance of Visions of Turtle Island. Uh, so we've done a lot of work in the education space. And um, you'll see that we've got uh, now a lot of Indigenous content under Community Classroom, which is the name of the program. If you like, you can see Elder Peter uh, speaking. Um, we're live streaming Visions. We'll be live streaming Susan at Glucark, who is an Oakville resident. So we've done a lot of work in this space. So um, this is a long-term relationship. It's not something that we, uh, you know, I phoned up Peter in October and said, hey, let's do this. This is a relationship <laughs> built on trust and uh, developed over time. And it's been inspired by Peter and his ideas of how we bring our communities together. Uh, in terms of recognition of the traditional territories, uh, yes, the Haudenosaunee were, were obviously on the land and we include that in our land acknowledgements. Um, it is part of the conversation, um, but we have to start somewhere in the conversation. Uh, there's a lot of relationships uh, between Six Nations and communities across Southern Ontario, as well as uh, with Sheridan College, and we do work with them very closely. So. Our focus has been really to um, share the history of the treaties here. And we hope that, you know, that is a starting point for us. And then these broader discussions can evolve because the treaties do exist and they do, you know, they are, it's important that we make them living documents and people see them locally and understand, you know, this is something that's happening here in Oakville. It's not about the Mohawk Institute outside of, you know, outside of Brant. Um, it's about things that are happening right here in this community, and it's living and breathing. And that is, you know, it's not, as Peter has indicated, it's not just about returning the heritage to Oakville. It's about returning that heritage to MCFN as well. It's missing in the discourse. And that's, that's the, to me, that's the most profound part of, you know, the erasure of legacy. Um, so that's, you know, that's where I get emotional on this one. Peter? Um, <clears throat> this uh, about putting lines on a map. Um, uh, when I'm asked to do a, a, a land acknowledgement, um, I don't do it the same way everyone else does um, because I start by saying I want to acknowledge the, the, the nations that were here first and I start naming them. Uh, Mentecook Nation, the Gigon Suck Nation, uh, the Manadon Suck Nation, and I can see somebody's looking at me and they're saying, I never heard of those ones before. And then I say, say I want to, those were the nations that were here first, and there's many of those. And, and then I say, you know, I want to now mention the nations that came next. And I might say the Anishinaabek Nation, the Ongohome Nation, the Lakota Nation. And then the nations that came after that were the, uh, the, the British, the French, the Italian, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so the nations that came here first, that were here first, 
Uh, the mythical nation are the trees. The gigon nation are the fish. The mana don't nation are the insects. And all those other nations that, that we look at as relatives were here before we got here. And if we don't recognize those nations, we will continue to destroy them until we destroy ourselves. And so the idea that we should be fighting over lines on a map becomes insignificant if you don't address the nations that were here first. And um, so really those are the kind of things that I look at and try to put those ideas out there so that we get beyond this idea of, you know, fighting over what was or wasn't. And, and I, I, I always say the government likes nothing more. They clap their hands and jump up and down with glee when you have two First Nations arguing with each other. <laughs> and so we don't want to do that. You can agree to disagree. That's the best thing to do. So anyway, that's my little five cents worth there. Appreciate that, Elder Schuler, and thank you, thank you both, uh, Peter and, and Wendy, both for those those remarks. Um, really powerful. Um, you Kang, I just want to go over to you about some of the kind of key learnings. We're just about out of time, so um, hand it over to you for maybe perhaps a minute. I um, regret to have to put it in, into such a short amount of time, but over to you for a, for a quick, uh, perhaps final thought there. Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, at Chinatown, we <clears throat> we really look forward to to well use use the the funding that that we are lucky enough to 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 be granted and um, to address some prominent issues that our community is facing. And also, um, there's going to be some major community events that are happening in Chinatown area. And I'd like to invite everyone, if you live nearby, please drop in at um, Chinatown and um, visit us. Thank you. That's really great. Thanks, Yu Kang. Um, we are uh, getting, uh, getting close to time. Uh, and I know there's a couple of questions in the chat that are, um, are, are, are there. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to leave them unanswered for the moment. Um, and they're, they're really good ones. Um, I, uh, I, I just want to say, of course, uh, a big thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today to talk about their projects. Um, I want to just uh, describe a couple of the kind of milestones that are still to come. Uh, for those of you who are considering applying for uh, the year two or round two funding, with the Community Activator Program, uh, the year two intake closes on February the 1st. Uh, and we're certainly hoping to have a you know, long list of inspiring and equity focused projects to fund across you know, our eligible communities. Um, if you are looking to talk about your project or if you have questions about the program, uh, its requirements, you know, or you know, just, just want kind of a sounding board, feel free to book some time uh, with me or with my colleague Cecile Roslin. Uh, you can find our contact info at uh, mymainstreet.ca uh, slash contact us. Um, I'll put that in the uh, in the chat as well. Uh, we've got uh, the ability to just you know you can book fifteen minutes with us, um, and um, you know we can we can have a chance to to chat. Um, I also want to say there, as uh, Deniva is noting in the in the chat as well, there is uh, one more info session that we're holding on this coming Monday uh, between eleven and twelve, uh, where you can register at mymainstreet.ca. Uh, that'll be a chance to just, we'll just go through, you know, really fast, you know, some of the key requirements, uh, and then there'll be an open Q&A session. I found, uh, we've heard from some applicants who found that that open Q&A session really valuable because other folks, you know, of course, were asking questions that they weren't necessarily thinking about, but that turned out to be um, really, uh, you know, really impactful. And finally, just kind of looking at my housekeeping notes. Um, I think that is it. I, you know, really want to thank all of our panelists today. You were, you were generous with your time and with your contributions today. Uh, really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing. You know, within your communities, this has been a um, 
obviously, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic has been a really challenging time for, you know, for everyone across Southern Ontario and around the world. Uh, and uh, that being said, it has also really exposed uh, some of the long-standing inequities, uh, you know, within our communities. And this is really, I think, an opportunity, um, you know, around bringing people back to Main Street in a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse way. And we really want to thank not only our panelists today, and you know all of our recipients for their work that they are doing, um, also the federal government uh, for their support uh, of the My Main Street project. And so, with all that said, on behalf of the team here at the Canadian Urban Institute, uh, thanks so much for your time this afternoon, and all the best.